Hi, I'm Trevor Christian, back with Sarah Siskin, and um, next track we're going to talk about is uh, Modern Appalachia. You uh, you list five, uh, sorry, you list four uh, influences on this mm -hmm. uh, track. Dolly Parton, you list Mahalia, you list Bill Frizzell, and Paul Brady. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of... Uh, what builds modern Appalachia for you? <laughs> yeah, they are some of they are some of them. Um, this song started as a story song about a woman uh, named Appalachia, and I wrote the whole song about this woman who was she was wild and free, but she was traditional yet progressive and mysterious and all these things and um it had pretty much the same melody as it does now but it was about a woman and I got all the way done with it I always knew that I wanted to name the album Modern Appalachia and so I thought that that was going to be the title track was a song about this woman and then I got really self-conscious at the end thinking that everybody would think that it was purely autobiographical and then I was calling myself all these things. And it really wasn't. It was more of a narrative on a type of human being that I, that is sort of a culmination of a lot of different people I knew growing up in North Carolina and still know to this day. And it's just sort of a commentary on the fascination of the mixture of old, you know, traditional roots with progressive ideas and then sort of the inevitable that we have to make progress, you know. So I sat around for a couple of days and thought, well, what am I going to do with this? I love this title. I love this theme. This feels really good to me as if maybe I've finally found a name for my genre, but I don't think I want it to be about a woman anymore. So I just scratched all the lyrics and I started over. And I um I thought, well what if I tell you know, tell a story that is a little bit more personal, but it's not necessarily about me as and my character, but it's about what has shaped me, who has shaped me. Um and so those four people, Dolly Parton, Mahalia Jackson, Bill Frizzell, Paul Brady I just let myself, and I do this a lot when I write, I just sort of step aside and let things come to me, and those were the first four, and then I stopped, and I just wrote them down. They just came. So they, those four names came, and then I stopped, and I was like, this is it. These are these are the four, and of course, you know, your your intuition or your sort of downloads that you get from a higher power don't really they don't know what modern Appalachia is or not <laughs> so those are the four names that came to me and then when I looked at it and I was like well obviously Dolly is from Appalachia and Mahalia in her own way although she was Louisiana um you know Bill Frizzell's from Colorado and lives in Washington State and Paul lives in Ireland so how does that relate how does that relate and I um looked at it and I was like well they're they're all very much in the same flavor of old meets new. They all have a real knowledge of the tradition of their music, but they all push forward in their music. They also, you know, I know I know Paul Brady and I know Bill. Um, obviously, I didn't get to meet Mahalia, and I don't know Dolly personally, but. I have a feeling if I met Dolly and could have met Mahalia, these four souls, the character of these four people also sort of in, encompass this this uh, marriage of old and new, ancient and free, which I also say in this song where it's this real respect for what came before, but a real excitement for for looking ahead and not just doing 
the same old, same old that everybody in, you know, others in their genre did. And so when I looked at it like that, and I could see that that, that those things were the common denominator, I was like, yeah, this is the perfect combination. These four right here are exactly who I need to write about in this song. And they all were very heavily, you know, played in my childhood growing up, and I was very influenced by all of them. So, And you don't necessarily have to live or be from a certain region in order to uh, gel with its musical style and really right. influence what it winds up becoming. And that um, point, you take that point and you take it another step forward, uh, further, and you and and you can say that you don't necessarily have to be from the same region as another person and be able to to gel with them. And I think it's something. It's sort of a. It's not talked about much in our country. Sort of the the north and south. I don't think that there's much of an issue there, but there are sort of stereotypes of each that we carry around. But what if we what if we didn't? You know, what if we Oh, and I know what for if, a fact that we have those stereotypical southerners bizarrely enough break right down to the Confederate flag uh sure. living up here in New York. And Sure. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, we you might have a higher concentration of those down south, but right. they're everywhere. And yep. the people you would associate with being New Yorkers, I guarantee you, you have, I mean, maybe not up in the mountains necessarily, but <laughs> you have, uh, I mean, if you're talking about city people, if you're talking about upstate, then yeah, you got those. Um, but sure. I'm sure... I'm sure down in more urban areas in the South, especially Nashville, you're getting plenty of uh, the same types of people you might happen to find up here. There there are types of people. I yes. definitely agree with the notion that there are types of people, but birth, is, you know, the place you're born into is not destiny as to which type you'll become. Exactly. Exactly. How cool was it? Um, how cool was it to actually get Bill Frizzell to come and do that song with you? So cool. Bill is amazing. I made um, a whole record with him, I think it's like 20 years ago now. My first full album was called Covered, and he played on most of that. And so I met him 20 years ago. And he did that in the studio with me. Um, this album he recorded remotely uh, on the two songs that he plays on. I sent him the tracks, and he recorded them in outside of Seattle. So I didn't get to see him. Um, you know, it was just much more cost effective to have him do it remotely. A lot of people are doing that now. Um, but we did yes, communicate. Remote. A lot of yeah. people are doing remote communication now. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. Yeah. And recording. I mean, I'm I'm in the middle of a couple of projects right now for film and TV where we're writing, you know, a writer and producer and I are, we wrote on FaceTime. We wrote the song on FaceTime and, and then I'm recording the bass track and the basic track, not bass, B-A-S-S, -S, but the, you know, guitar vocal and then sending it to the producer and he's building upon it and a lot of people are doing that right now. Um, I thought of doing a whole album. I'm sure somebody's going to do it where I, I send songs out to like 12 different collaborators and have them build remotely, you know, on, on, on the songs and then put out an album like the quarantine sessions or something. I'm sure it'll happen. I just, uh, I'm focused on modern Appalachia right now. <laughs> There's not enough time in the day. But anyway, sorry to get uh, down a rabbit hole, but um, Bill Frizzell is a, such a hero of mine, and I, I feel really lucky that he he wanted to play on this. And um, I was just happy to also, you know, 
provide him with a song that sang about him because he deserved it. I think that's a good trade. Yeah. I think that's a good trade. You know, he gets gets a name check and, you know, the feeling of being someone's hero in that way. And all he has to do is do what he does best. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, Last one I want to talk about is um, a little bit troubled um, for, or based on your music video, the flower opening song. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, we'll hear it after we're done talking, um, but the, the simple gist and real effective way is grounding the story in just a few sentences. Daddy's on the road, mom is on the bottle, baby is going to be okay, just a little bit troubled. And then you go on to ask about forgiveness, um, forgiving yourself. I'm presuming you mean from baby's point of view, or do you mean, uh, do you mean from one of the parents? Well, I really mean, uh, universally singing to um I'm sort of singing to the listener at that point um the I would say the the narrative on this song goes between third person and first person because I do go you know I do have one verse where I say if I could go back and forget you know stand under that tree would I forgive myself for my history um you know, this is a real stream of consciousness song when I wrote it, which means I I don't do a whole lot of editing to make it make sense. And I trust that the way that it was sort of delivered to me in real time is the way it's supposed to be written. So it's kind of a – but I did – one thing I did intentionally do, which I, I, I love to do, but it really works for this album – is, you know, to do a real straightforward chorus that almost feels old and traditional and then do progressive, more poetic landing uh, verses. And on this one, that's what I did with the, you know, sort of some fun chord changes and um, lyrics that may make sense to some and may not make sense to others, whereas the chorus is real straightforward and it's very sort of high mountain you know like it could be a kind of a folk tale so i mean this song is really complex for me um it's a it's about a lot of things i mean one one is just sort of the imperfection of all human you know sort of as you get older, looking back, reflecting on your life, thinking about how, isn't that interesting that when I was a child, I thought everything was just hunky dory. <laughs> um, but then you get to be an adult and you reflect on your life and you see, see it in a different light. It's not bad. It's just you sort of, you're, you're changing your perspective a little bit, um, as an adult or, or as a parent. You know, so that's the other thing is that this was a commentary on sort of generational pain. Um, and the, the family where dad's always gone and mom's holding it together, um, having, you know, some drinks to kind of keep the edge off of her stress and then baby gets the trickle down effect. Well, you know, that story, however you, assign mom and dad and what they, you know, maybe it's mom that's gone and dad that's home. But that story of parents really trying just to, just to hold it together to raise children and live is about as common as bread. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's almost everybody's story. <laughs> um, but you know, you don't, when you're a kid, you don't see it that way. Um, and so I guess I, I was really reflecting on some of my own personal 
memories as a child and then now what does it look like now that I'm a mother? Um, but like, what was it like for my mother's mother and my dad's mother? And, and it was all this, this description in the chorus is, uh, you know, can, can be pretty applicable to, to my life and my childhood and some of my family's life. Um, but yet we are all good people. And we function in the world and we love each other. But, um, you know, I have to have therapy and some of my only uh, other family members have to have therapy. And we all uh, have these imperfections that we uh, sort of start unpacking as adults. That when we were kids, we just we had these rose colored glasses on, you know, as like, man, the world is is so wide and beautiful and mom and dad are perfect. and um I'm happy to be alive and um and then you you know you go through it yourself and you have kids or even if you don't have kids you know you come into your own and you you go out in the world and you get a job and you have relationships and you go through all these life challenges that as a child you just you can't even comprehend how you would ever go through those things so um so yeah I mean in summary it's really just a it's about how we are all broken, uh, and that's okay, you know. Yeah, um, and um, when you talk about forgiveness, it's uh, no, it's not just the forgiveness uh, that you sort of owe to yourself because not all of the brokenness was your fault. Uh, uh, the brokenness you inherited, but also when you talk about is it worth the chance a second dance coming now? Well, right. The forgiveness goes so hand in hand with a second chance. Right. You allow yourself a second chance if you forgive yourself, but if you don't forgive yourself, you're constantly living in the past. So, you know, is it worth it? to go back and, and, and dig through that stuff, is it worth it to you to 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 work on yourself, to to move past some of those sort of trip trip ups that keep you sort of coming back to the same places of pain. Um, you know, I think it's worth it. But um yeah, I'm throwing that question out there to, to everyone sort of um as uh a reflection of how, you know, how important it is. It doesn't mean if you go back and you forgive yourself that you're going to feel 100% renewed and, and you know, all put together, but it does lighten your load because I think self-criticism and, uh, you know, self-induced um, pain is is the most powerful more than other people um, doing it, so. Yes, um, let's uh, let's uh, tie things up with uh, another somewhat autobiographical detail um, and uh, also touch on the uh, theme of modern Appalachia besides listing those influences and how they impacted you. Mm-hmm. You're finding out who we are, finding out who we are, you know. That's something you not just learn from life, but learn from the music you listen to. And okay. you also mention that at one point you are a punk rock girl. You were a punk <laughs> rock girl. And... Yeah. How much did you change as a result of uh, moving out of the punk rock sphere and moving more towards uh, folk and country? Well, I would say I was not from the standpoint of an artist, but as a standpoint of just a, a human being, I was, I was folk and country first because I was raised in a house um of 
traditional old time and bluegrass music because my parents both played and still do. So when I when I so I grew up with that. I grew up going to all the festivals, the acoustic festivals and fiddlers conventions. Um, when I got into um, more alternative music, it was uh, it opened up this this whole world to me because I all, always had a little bit of a real emotional edge, and I couldn't, you know, it didn't always fit in with the more traditional music um, as far as when I was playing. So, yeah, I, I was in a punk rock band when I was 14, 15 years old for a while, and, uh, you know, I was, I didn't scream and yell, but I danced around and sang to some pretty loud rock punk music and um i explored that for a while i mean you know i was 15 so i was at that age where i was trying things out i really loved it and i do think that i embodied it in my own way um and then from there i went down the road of rock fusion and rush and yes and getting into you know maha vishnu orchestra and trilat gertu and all that sort of more world music um and it just scratched this huge itch for me. I didn't even know I had. I mean, I just absolutely drank it up. Um, and then I lived in Seattle for a couple of years when I first left. Um, I lived in Nashville really early on, and then I left, and then I came back. But um, I was in Seattle when I was about 19, and I I thought I was going to stay out there for a while, but I was driving down the road, you know, and I was sort of, in that post grunge like singer songwriter you know Seattle I mean it was a long time ago but but I was driving down the road and Bill Monroe came on the radio it was just him and his mandolin singing I don't remember what but you know some classic Highlands and bluegrass song and I just absolutely fell apart just my body collapsed and I started bawling I had to like pull off the highway on an exit and just cry um, because I realized I had really sort of abandoned my roots. Um, and it's all, I mean, you know, that's what we do when we're teenagers, young adults, we go off and we explore, right? But, uh, I, it was that at that point that I decided to move to Nashville. And then I, I started putting the punk rock with the jazz, with, with the country, with the bluegrass, with the, the old time and um and started really finding my voice so i don't know if that answers your question but uh that sort of gives you an idea of the the transformation there from one thing to another and and punk rock girl is it has a couple of parallel themes i mean it's talking about my musical past but it's it's also talking about vulnerability in that the fact that when i was you know younger say a teenager and I was all very open-hearted I've always been really open-hearted sometimes to a fault and I always thought oh well it'll get better as I get older I'll get tougher I'll get more skills I'll have more life experience to to be able to guard my heart from from getting hurt or or falling in love again or this that and the other and what I realized was it was the opposite um, sort of the more I lived, the more I love. And when I wrote this song, I was just kind of reflecting on the fact that, man, I think I might have been a lot tougher when I was a teenager because I was naive. And now that I'm older and I've been through decades of life and love and loss and had kids and gone through the, you know, gamut, I'm actually even more vulnerable to people and um and and even more uh easily this sort of fall fall i just fall for people and i don't mean like i'm in love with everyone i just am I just that's just how i like to operate i just you know people really fascinate me so that was the sort of the subplot of that song which is the End, ending line of the chorus, you know, I'm just a folk fatale falling apart for the innocence of love. So that's what that's about. 
Yeah, I suppose um I suppose you do have to soften that up a little uh when moving away from punk rock, but um no, it's uh it is it is incredible to see how types of music and how places you are in your life can sort of come together or you know, eventually blend with each other and yeah. create a more full picture. I went through a punk rock phase too as a teenager and I got to admit when I hear it now I just grimace like, oh, what were you doing, Trevor? What were you doing? Right. But, well, it's different now. Punk punk is so different than it was when I was young. I don't know how old you are, but, you know, it punk used to be so much more of a raw emotional expression, almost like rap in a way, but um and the and the and it was just real grungy, whereas now I feel like a lot of punk is is very glossy in a way. Um which is odd. Well, I was growing up. I was uh growing up in the early 2000s. Oh, okay. You know. Yeah, you spring chicken. Kind of. I mean, yeah. I'm not that much younger than you. Only like, only yeah. I guess 14 years is a bit younger, but yeah. Um, That's all right. So by the time you were in the punk rock, it was already starting to turn. I feel like it was starting to popify a little bit. Back in my day. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was just it was a really it was an outlet to be to be really raw and not even not even negative or or you know I mean we we were just kids, you know, uh listening to like 7 seconds and um you know the 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 bands that predated Green Day and all of that and um we were just so into it. They were, they were, a lot of those bands were talking about politics and talking about love and, uh, you know, it was interesting. Um, the, that, the, the punk that I grew up on, which I guess would be more of the 80s punk. Um, and this is making me want to go revisit it, but I will tell you, there's, there's a really fun feeling about getting on a stage with just a bunch of loud, well-played guitars and bass and drums and getting to just thrash around and not care. <laughs> and I guess, you know, that's the other thing is like, I got to, I could, I could do that then. I don't know if I could do that now. I, Cause I know too much. <laughs> <laughs> does, so, does it feel good? Does it feel good? Uh, whipping out the line back in my day. Um, oh my gosh. That's, I'm laughing at myself cause that's like what your grandparents say, right? You're so, 42. Yeah. You're, you, yeah. I just you, you're you're not you're not there yet. I'm sorry. You're no, not. I'm not. And I'm if you not. are there, maybe for maybe for people who are still kids, but yeah. There you oh, go. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely say that to my kids sometimes. Back in my day, you know, I don't say we walked to school, you know, five miles in the snow, but I. I do say that. Back in my day, we didn't have iPads, so dot, dot, dot. Look out. Oh, no, my dad's too <laughs> busy with his iPad to say that. Um, yeah, he has, yeah. He's happily adapted. Um, well, um, back in my day, this is what we would call a, a lovely interview. Lots of great ideas explored. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show, Sarah Siskin. Thank you for having me, Trevor. I really appreciate it.